A crooked New York State judge just ruled that I have to pay a fine of $355 million for having built a perfect company. Seems to be a day of reckoning for Donald Trump in his New York civil fraud case as he has been fined more than $355 million and banned from running his own company there. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. The judge dealing the former president a major blow, finding, quote, overwhelming evidence that Trump and his adult sons and top executives committed fraud. Now, on top of the $355 million plus fine, Trump has been banned from personally running a business in New York for the next three years. Now, this is the first time a former U.S. president has been found by a court to have committed extensive fraud. In his ruling, Judge Arthur Engoron honed in on Trump's testimony, specifically writing, overall, Donald Trump rarely responded to the questions asked, and he frequently interjected long, irrelevant speeches on issues far beyond the scope of the trial. His refusal to answer the questions directly or in some cases at all severely compromised his credibility. New York Attorney General Letitia James, who brought the case against Trump back in 2022, said the ruling showed that no one is above the law. Everyday Americans cannot lie to a bank about how much money they have in order to get a mortgage to buy a home or a loan to keep their business afloat or to send their child to college. And if they did, our government would throw the book at them. Uh, Trump's lawyers vowed to appeal that decision even before it was announced in a statement they called the verdict a politically fueled witch hunt designed to take down Donald Trump. And then there was Trump himself speaking outside Mar-a-Lago tonight, accusing the judge of corruption and saying the case was all a plot to derail his presidential campaign. I weren't running. None of this stuff would have ever happened. None of these lawsuits would have ever happened. Nothing would. I would have had a nice life. And NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis is outside Trump Tower in New York. She joins us now. Now, Rahima, New York Attorney General Letitia James wanted the judge to ban Trump from New York real estate business for life. We didn't see that happen. The fine is, is actually $16 million less than she was hoping for. So can you walk us through what we saw today in court? Yeah, what uh, Judge Ngoron did, as you point out, God, he didn't ban him for life, but he did ban Donald Trump from doing business in New York and real estate, et cetera, for three years. Granted, they can, might consider that a win because he could have gotten a ban for life if Letitia James, the state attorney general, had gotten what she had requested. And this also has an impact on his two adult sons. They were banned for two years from doing business, and they were essentially running the Trump enterprise uh, at the time, right now. And in addition, they were fined a little more than $4 million each in terms of their participation in what the judge has called a fraud. Now, I should say this as well in terms of what Letitia James was able to secure today for the state. She said that as a result of the interest Donald Trump will be looking at something like $460 million in fines because she said he's going to be fined $100 million additional in interest. And she said that will grow every single day until this fine is paid. Gotti? Well, Rahima, just doing a little bit of math here. So $355 million plus something like another $100 million for interest, plus another $83 million for that defamation case, plus obviously all his legal fees, plus that $25 million from that Trump University fraud case a few years ago. Uh, big question here. Could all this leave him bankrupt? It is staggering to think about for the average person. And I have to say, I think it's causing even the Donald Trump enterprise a moment of pause today to think about adding up all of those numbers that you just mentioned, Gotti. Could it lead to bankruptcy? Maybe that's what some people in the organization fear. Maybe he could get some um, infusion of cash from some foreign investors. Who knows in terms of all of that? What we do know is that this is a staggering blow to the Trump enterprise, to the Trump brand. You know he wrote a book called The Art of the Deal. Letitia James, the attorney general tonight, said what Donald Trump did was perfect the art of the steal. And she is hoping that now the courts 
and the legal system will make him pay for that. And it's a pretty hefty fine he's being ordered to pay tonight. Gotti? Rahima Ellis in New York. Thank you so much, Rahima. And to break down, the uh, Donald Trump's son, Eric Trump, an executive vice president of the Trump Organization, is responding to the verdict. Speaking on Fox News just a little bit ago, he defended his family and said essentially that this is not over. My father built the skyline of New York City, and this is the thanks he gets for doing absolutely nothing wrong, not a dollar financial loss. The exact opposite, hundreds of millions of dollars in financial gain. And as to Don and I, we, every single witness testified, we have nothing to do with this. Honestly, it's so egregious. It's so egregious, I promise you we're gonna get overturned. And let's bring in NBC News legal analysts, Angela Sinandela and Danny Savalos. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Angela, uh, this isn't just telling a former president to fork over 355 million plus like another 100 million in interest. This is also telling him he is personally barred from running a business in New York for three years. Like, how does that even get enforced? So look here, I think for the context of the dissolution of his businesses and not being able to run them, we have to rewind a little bit. And that's to the first summary judgment. When Judge Angoran made that decision, he also ordered the dissolution of all of Trump's businesses in New York State. Trump's team then appealed that. The appellate court then put a hold on the dissolution of these businesses. Now, there is some debate over whether or not Angoran even made the right decision there. If he had that authority, if he was only allowed to dissolve some of the businesses that were affected or it had fraud involved and were not was not allowed to dissolve all of them. So in this new ruling, what he did is he backtracked. He said, look, I am not going to dissolve these. What I'm going to do is appoint basically a, a probation officer, a watchdog, somebody who's going to sit there and make sure that he complies with this enforcement. So that's where we are today, and that's how it will be enforced. So a watchdog may be in Trump Tower keeping an eye on the former president to make sure he doesn't do his business. Interesting. Uh, Danny, I, I got to ask, I mean, was there a particular smoking gun here? I know a lot of this has to do with the valuations of his properties. Uh, is this a, a, a big picture or like was there one thing that stood out? Here's who the smoking gun was not. It was not Michael Cohen. And that's according to Justice Ngoron, who made a point of saying that Michael Cohen was a witness, but he wasn't the linchpin uh, that the Trump team made him out to be. And by that, I mean the Trump-associated defendants. Michael Cohen was not as critically important as they would make him out to be. And, you know, that was pretty apparent from the beginning. Michael Cohen was an interesting witness. He had some probative information, but he was never the most important witness uh, in this case. He will be probably the most important witness in the Manhattan DA's criminal case against Donald Trump. But in this case, not so much. Uh, if there was a smoking gun, it would be this. It would be that the statements of financial condition that Justice and Gorin concluded months ago that they were inaccurate and essentially fraudulent. And that was basically the end of the case before it ever even got started. So once that happened, uh, under New York law, there doesn't need to be a victim. There doesn't need to be someone who was actually uh, persuaded by these fraudulent statements. Uh, the outcome was almost uh, predetermined after the summary judgment motion. Although I will say during the course of the case, uh, Justice Ngoron may have been keeping his mind open as to the remaining counts. Uh, but this opinion issued today, this decision rather, uh, left no doubt that Justice, Justice Ngoron was not persuaded by any of the uh, Trump defendants expert witnesses. Uh, this case pretty clearly went dollar for dollar the way the attorney general wanted it to go. And Angela, what, what happens now? I'm sure on one hand, you know, obviously Trump's team is going to appeal. On the other, uh, could you see other prosecutors in other cities looking at what happened in New York and then wondering if, if they may also have cases there? Yes, well, we know he is definitely going to appeal, and he's just going to throw the book in this appeal. But I don't think that appeal is going to have a great chance. And that comes down to not a, any moral or political issue, but really, if you look at the statute that this entire case was based on, the attorney general had wide discretion to almost institute and ask for any penalty she wanted based on almost any form of misrepresentation. She had all the power here. So Justice Ngoron essentially just enforced what the attorney general wanted. Now, in terms of what other states would do, they would look to see, does the attorney general in that state also 
have such wide power. What holdings does Donald Trump have there? I do think in light of the election, though, there's not a lot of time. These investigations take forever. So will we see one before the investigate before the election? Likely not. Angela Sinandella and Danny Savalos, thank you so much for joining us. And don't go too far because there is still a lot to talk about. Day two in that case of Fannie Willis. We're going to be checking back with you in just a bit. And NBC News correspondent Von Hillier joins us now from West Palm Beach, Florida. Von, not long after that decision came down, Trump's campaign sent this, this text to his supporters rallying for donations, and they called this undeniable election interference. Uh, so, question, among his base, like, are they going to care about this? Is this going to help or is this going to hurt his campaign or are they just going to see this as, you know, another witch hunt? Right. I, I, well, let's look at it this way, Gotti. Donald Trump is going to try to make out of this what he can to his political benefit because a massive fine like this and the fact that he'd be unable to do business in the state of New York for three years in no way is good for Donald Trump's personal pocketbook or his corporation. But when you're looking at the politics of this, Donald Trump has one thing on his mind, and it's at that November election here. And to the extent that he can fundraise off of what he contends is political prosecution and bias judge in his words, he's going to do exactly that. And Gotti, for him, winning the White House is uh, imperative because that ultimately will come down to not a jury or not a judge, but it'll come down to the American election to determine whether they feel like Donald Trump has been unfairly treated or unfairly targeted. And Vaughn, this is just one of a handful of cases against Trump. What's he juggling over the next couple of months here? Right. All of this is coming to a head here in the year of 2024. For Donald Trump, uh, he has the first of what could be four criminal trials awaiting him slated to begin on March 25th. That's just 39 days away. And that trial we expect to last about six weeks. Now, you'll look at the political calendar. This is uh, coming at a time that the South Carolina primary is taking place. But for Donald Trump, he's in a good position politically in the Republican field here. And his team believes that they can actually secure enough delegates in this Republican battle to secure the nomination and be the presumptive nominee as soon as March 19th. And so that would be six days before that criminal trial were even to begin. That that hush money payment trial is expected to take about six weeks, which would take us to the first week of May. And then at that point, we're looking at potentially the federal election interference case in Washington, D.C. And that case is up in the air right now as we wait to hear whether the Supreme Court will hear an appeal from Donald Trump or not. But that trial could begin as soon as June even. So for Donald Trump, it's going to be a balance between the political and the legal here ahead of that November election in 2024. Vaughn Hilliard, thanks so much, brother. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. This is not the only trial today involving former President Trump. Next, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis is trying to stay on Trump's election interference case in Georgia, despite facing a whole lot of scrutiny over a romantic relationship with her special prosecutor. Plus, he was one of Vladimir Putin's most outspoken critics, and now Russia says Alexei Navalny has died in prison, but some reports say he was killed. So what exactly happened? And there's a case of the bubonic plague in Oregon, and it might have come from a pet cat. We're going to explain that in just a bit, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. And here's some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Virginia is being sued over its guidance for transgender students in public schools. In two lawsuits, two students allege the rules prevented them from playing on the sports team of their choice and allowing teachers to refuse to use their preferred names. Now, the guidance they mentioned was issued last year by Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin. And Senator Joe Manchin is not running for president this year. The West Virginia Democrat announced in November that he wouldn't seek re-election. And since then, he's been considering a third-party run for the White House, but he has decided now is not the time. And while we're probably going to be seeing some shady AI stuff around the election, some tech giants are promising to try to prevent any interference. Some 20 companies so far, like Meta and Google, have voluntarily signed this pledge that they will try and prevent their software from interfering. Now, with the companies saying they're going to use tools to regulate AI while we wait for actual regulations from the actual government. 
And President Biden was in East Palestine, Ohio today, more than a year after that toxic train derailment. Biden was met with criticism, though, that he should have been there sooner and done more sooner. The president has vowed to hold the train company Norfolk Southern accountable. And Paul McCartney had a little reunion recently with his famous bass guitar. That was stolen 50 years ago in an online campaign to get it back. It actually worked. The guitar was a key part of the Beatles' image during their rise to fame and used in a bunch of McCartney's live shows. As for where it was found, well, apparently Southern England with the original case. And in Georgia, we are following day two of a court hearing in the election interference case against Donald Trump. And in a surprise move, prosecutors did not call Fulton County District Attorney Fonny Willis to testify again today after an explosive testimony from her yesterday. But we did hear from her dad. He helped answer one of the key questions from yesterday. Why didn't Willis have any receipts for the trips she and her lead prosecutor took together? Take a listen. Your Honor, I'm not trying to be racist, okay? But it's a black thing, okay? You know, I was trained, and most black folks, they hide cash, or they keep cash. And I've told my daughter, you keep six months' worth of cash, always. I've always kept safes. And as a matter of fact, I gave my daughter uh, her first cash box and told her, always keep some cash. Now let's bring in NBC News legal analysts again, Angela Sinandella and Danny Savalas. Thank you guys so much for sticking with us. Uh, so, Danny, first off, uh, why didn't Willis testify again today? And, and what did you make of her dad's testimony? Uh, first, Willis didn't testify because the state did something very smart. They declined to follow up with any examination after the defense attorneys uh, examined her. And under the rules, if they don't ask her any new questions, there's nothing to ask about on redirect. So great strategic move. They foreclosed Bonnie Willis. And uh, you better believe one thing they didn't do, the state, the night before. They didn't send an email to the defense saying, hey, you guys don't have to waste your time preparing because you're not going to get to examine her again. It's a great strategic <laughs> move to keep them working all all night until three in the morning preparing more questions for Fannie Willis, questions they never got to ask. Believe me, that kind of thing happens all the time. As for dad, how did her father perform? I thought he performed very well. Uh, I thought he was, he answered questions. He had his daughter's tendency to ramble and answer the question that wasn't asked, but all in all, very respectful. I thought he did a better job than his daughter testifying. Uh, you heard that sound piece on the cash item. I think he did a very good job of injecting the issue of making this about whether or not it's okay to, to have cash and use cash, which by the way, Perfectly okay to use cash. Most of my clients pay me in cash. Nothing wrong with cash. The real issue is whether or not the explanation of repaying her boyfriend cash for all of their vacations is credible. That is the narrow issue, not whether or not it's okay to pay with cash. Of course it's okay to pay with cash. Cash is how we pay for things. So that is a very good job, I thought, of subtly making it about, hey, nothing wrong with cash. Smart move. Uh, smart testimony. All in all, I think the state had a pretty good day today. Now, the other big question in this whole saga is when did they start dating and when was he hired? We know when he was hired. And both Fani uh, and Wade have said that they didn't start dating until after he was hired. Uh, Angela, let's listen to a former colleague of Nathan Wade's, uh, Terrence Bradley, who also testified today. Kind of a little bit about that timeline. Take a listen. Did Mr. Wade, prior to November 1st of 2021, ever talk to you about socializing with Ms. Willis? I can't recall. I have no personal knowledge of when it actually happened. Um, I was not there. I do not have any personal knowledge, so I would choose not to answer that question. So, Angela, he's a question mark. We've got a former friend of Fani who says that they were dating before. Then you got both Fani and Wade saying that they started dating after. Is this a settled issue? 
No, it's not at all, Gotti. And I almost think that Bradley's testimony is just emblematic of how this entire hearing is going for the defense. What do I mean by that? Remember, Bradley was supposed to be the defense's star witness. He was, in fact, test texting Ashley Merchant about all sorts of things. So she came in there thinking that this man was going to save the day for her. And what did he do? He stonewalled. He kept asserting privilege. And the defense was not properly prepared to be able to pierce that privilege. They had to ask so so many questions, and that that final question will be determined later by the judge. But this, to me, was a disaster. Bradley didn't give the inches that the defense thought that he was going to. And Denny, I, I, I keep seeing this case, following what's going on, and then you lose sight of the of the actual case. This is about Trump and election interference, and that's going to be the things that we normally see, like beyond a reasonable doubt, and 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 so forth. But what is, like, the burden here? And do you think, based on what you've seen over the last two days, we'll see Willis kicked off the case? Yeah, this case is not about a motion to dismiss because two prosecutors may have been dating. That's never what the case has been about. That kind of thing happens all the time. It happens in all industries. Uh, so it's really about whether or not, and the defense's theory is an ambitious one, it's that the state money when Fannie Willis hired uh, Nathan Wade as a special prosecutor, that the state money that went to Nathan Wade went right back to Fannie Willis uh, because they went on vacations together. That's really it. And then now uh, the state, Fannie Willis and the state, have created a new issue, which is did they lie when they represented to the court uh, that the relationship happened, started rather, after uh, Wade was appointed? If there is a finding in the affirmative on that. That would be a major unforced error uh, by the state if they ended up being deceptive or lying on that affidavit or on that representation. Because, you know, look, the cover up is often worse than the underlying conduct. And I just can't stress enough it's not that they had a relationship. It's really two issues. Number one, this theory that the money was a kind of, and I hate to use the word kickback, but that the money found its way back to Fannie Willis as a benefit, uh, or is it credible that Fannie Willis and Wade's explanation that for every single vacation, Fannie Willis opened her purse or wallet, pulled out uh, a stack of cash and handed it to Nathan Wade to pay him back for it? If that's credible, because they've been consistent, but if it's credible and we only judge McAfee knows, then that will be a major factor in this in this decision. But you're right, Gotti, uh, does it have anything to do with the substantive guilt or innocence of any of the defendants? Heck no. This is quite the chapter one for Judge McAfee. Uh, Angela, uh, speaking of the judge, when, when can we see a decision uh, on this particular issue? So we have some time. And look, even though I just said the defense really didn't do the greatest job here, I will say that overall the defense is winning because this is buying them so much more time. It is delaying. It's continued to be delayed. Now, this hearing that was supposed to probably only be a few hours turned into two days. And now the judge says that that friend that we saw the testimony of, Bradley, he's going to have to meet with behind closed doors to see if this privilege will be sustained and if it could be pierced and if there's additional testimony. Then he, then he has to schedule summary arguments on both sides. And then after that, he has to make a ruling. So we don't expect to see a ruling this next week. I mean, it could be weeks from now. Angela Sinandella and Danny Savalos, I can hang out with you guys all night, but I've already taken too much of your Friday night. So thank you so much for joining us. And coming up, someone in Oregon has the bubonic plague. Yeah, that plague, like from the olden days. But before you freak out, we are going to tell you what you need to know. But first, you got to see this. This is a cop in Florida being hailed as a hero for his quick response to a horrific crash. A motorcycle sped by him going over 100 miles an hour and crashed into another car. He unfortunately found the motorcycle driver dead and wedged into the other car. But he heard the crying from inside. And just a warning, this is hard to watch. Come here, sweetheart. Come here. I know, ma'am. I'm helping you. I'm trying to help you. Come here. Come here, sweetheart. Come here. Come help me, please. 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 I need you to hold this little girl, please. I know. I'm coming, ma'am. I know, I do. Okay. Is your baby okay? No. She's right there. Let me check, let me check, let me check. No, 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 I 
They have a pulse. Sergeant Dave Musgrove, he did not stop those life saving compressions until EMS arrived. And you heard it there the baby survived. It is going to be a long road to recovery, but she made it through, and both the mother and the other child are doing fine. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back, and here's some of the stories happening out here in the West. Several L.A. firefighters hurt in that explosion yesterday have been released from the hospital. In total, nine firefighters were hurt in that explosion. We're seeing that video today. And that was when a tractor trailer powered by natural gas caught fire and blew up. Now, two of the firefighters are still in the hospital with one in critical condition. The explosion knocked some of the firefighters unconscious, and there's still no word on what caused that truck to catch fire. And staying here in L.A., a national historic landmark has been closed indefinitely because it's literally on shaky ground. Now, this is the Wayfarers Chapel in Rancho Palos Verdes, also known as the Glass Church. And it sits on this peninsula prone to landslides. And recently, I mean, you can see some of them there. Cracks are beginning to appear in the structure. The chapel announced all reservations will be refunded. And Prince Harry, he says he's considered becoming an American citizen. Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, famously left their royal duties behind to move to Santa Barbara, California, four years ago. And he said in a new interview that becoming a U.S. citizen has crossed his mind, but it's not really a high priority for him right now. And out here in California, get those rain boots ready again because we've got not just one, but two back-to-back -back atmospheric rivers headed our way again, which is expected to bring heavy rainfall over the weekend and into next week. So here's NBC meteorologist Bill Karens on what's to come. Dottie, you just say the name Atmospheric River and people start going on the West Coast. Uh-oh, here we go again. But this one is going to be more spread out over a longer duration, and it doesn't have the intensity of the big one from a couple weeks ago. But we still have, you know, the at least... Things are in place for minor problems with this one, not major like the last storm. So you can see here's the West Coast. You can obviously see this big, huge swirl in the middle of the screen here, middle of the Pacific. And this is what we call the atmospheric moisture. You can literally see it looks like a river in the sky, all the bright white clouds. That's the moisture streaming towards California. And then behind this, we have another storm that's going to be coming in, too. So we have a combination of a slow moving system that's going to be stalled out here with connections to the tropics. You know, here's Hawaii. That's that tropical plume. Sometimes we call it Pineapple Express. This one's not quite from Hawaii, just south of there. But this plume will come and be pushing moisture into the mountainous areas of Southern California and Central California as we go throughout the next five days. It's not going to rain the entire time, but there will be periods of rain. Here's the five-day forecast. Remember with the big, huge storm, you know, L.A. had eight inches of rain. Other locations were five to six inches. So this isn't nothing. But, you know, it's not what we had. So, you know, maybe four inches in Santa Barbara and the mountains could possibly get up to eight inches. So if we get that all quick enough, especially any thunderstorms, that's when you could talk about the possibility of some flash floods, some mudslides, rock and debris flows. So we have 25 million people in flood watches, and this goes all the way out through Wednesday. So this is a long duration event here. And as I mentioned, periods of time, different areas from the Bay, Sacramento, Northern California, back down to the mountains outside of Santa Barbara and L.A. will have periods of rain out of this and of course the mountains this time of year you do expect to get the heavy snow and we were really hurting in snowpack and now we're about the 85 percent of normal and after this storm we'll easily add another two feet we're going to be probably pretty close to where we should be um, the snowfall forecast a little bit smaller in areas of the northern Rockies it's mostly going to be in California mountains and a little bit in the Wasatch range that we get some of the heavier snow amounts so here's the timing of this as we go throughout Saturday definitely a rainy day San Francisco and northern California California. Notice that L.A. southward, you are fine, you are clear. Saturday looks like a just fine day. But by the time we get to Sunday, some of that light rain will be moving through. And then you notice that next wave comes in right behind it. And this is going to be Sunday night in the Bay Area. So you kind of get the idea here, Gotti. This isn't just one storm pinpointing in 12 hours, a long duration event on isolated problems in different spots over the next five days. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out and hopefully not too much damage will be done. Fingers crossed. Bill Cairns, thanks so much. And despite the snow and the winter storms we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, January was actually the hottest ever recorded, making it the eighth consecutive month of record hot global temperatures. Now, scientists are concerned over how all this heat is affecting our oceans and in a domino effect, 
what this could mean for hurricane season. National climate reporter Chase Kane brings us a global temperature check. Boil a pot of water, turn off the heat, and notice how long the water stays hot. The same thing is happening with Earth's oceans, except we haven't turned off the heat yet, because the primary source of heat is humans burning oil, coal, and gas. And climate scientists are increasingly concerned. We're starting to see the impacts of the greenhouse gases themselves. Um, they're ratcheting up at levels you know, that, that we've never seen before. You know, the ocean warming is the part that really concerns me, especially in regions like South Florida, where the reality is that's not going back down. The oranges and reds on this map show where ocean temperatures were above average at the start of 2023. And look what's happened over the last 12 months. This chart puts the ocean heat in context outside any natural variations. The orange line is 2023, already off the charts. Then look at the black line of this year so far, even hotter. And maybe two or three degrees doesn't sound like a lot to you, but think about the last time you were sick. If you took your temperature and it was 101 or approaching 102 degrees, you'd probably call the doctor, right? Especially if that fever kept creeping higher and higher. And that's exactly what's happening in our oceans. The extreme heat is killing fish, the food we eat, killing fragile coral reefs, and setting the stage for a concerning start to hurricane season. As Earth transitions to La Nina, that helps increase Atlantic hurricane activity by creating more favorable conditions. Because of the higher ocean temperatures. Freddie Otto is one of the world's leading scientists studying how climate affects extreme weather. And she warns that record hot oceans increase the likelihood a hurricane quickly intensifies into a destructive one. Like with Otis, Idalia, and Ian. And every hurricane that that now exists contains more moisture than it would have without climate change and that means the rainfall associated is in every case stronger than it would have been and so the flood damage from hurricanes is larger because of climate change and storms aside oceans help moderate temperature on land so the hotter they get the hotter we get so it's important that we turn off the source of the heat by turning off fossil fuels in new york i'm national climate reporter chase kane Chase Kane, thanks so much. Two teenagers faced gun charges in connection with this week's mass shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl rally. That shooting killed one person and left 22 others hurt. We are expecting additional charges as the investigation continues. And NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has more. Gotti, 48 hours after the mass shooting here on Wednesday at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl celebration, two unnamed teenagers have now been charged. They're facing resisting arrest and gun-related charges. That's according to juvenile court officials here in the area who say additional charges could very well be coming. The police chief also saying yesterday, and police reiterating today, they're not closing the door on more suspects in this case. Of course, 23 people we now know were shot here on Wednesday, one of them a local DJ was killed almost half or excuse me at least at least half police said of those who were shot were kids younger than 16. today we talked to 10 year old samuel ariano he showed me the shoe print on the back of his patrick mahomes jersey where he was trampled in the chaos and he showed me the hole in his jersey as well from the bullet that grazed his ribs coming within millimeters doctors said of his lungs here's part of our conversation what did you think when they told you that, that it was centimeters away from your lungs? I started crying. Why? But, like, I was kind of happy because if it hit my lungs, it would have been a different situation. A whole, like, bad one because I would have started bleeding. Thank God I wasn't bleeding. Like, I wasn't bleeding. Samuel, by the way, telling us that when he grows up, he wants to be a football player, possibly a quarterback like his idol, Patrick Mahomes. I asked if he had a message for the team, and he said, just tell them to stay safe. Speaking of Mahomes, today we got these photos of him and his wife, Brittany, visiting two little girls who are still hospitalized after being shot. A strange tie-in, those girls, their mom is the cousin of Lisa Lopez Galvan, the woman who was killed in the shooting. Actually, four members of that family total were shot. And of course, it's the same family that now famously Taylor Swift, who's dating tight end Travis Kelsey, donated $100,000 to, writing, my deepest sympathies. Got it. NBC's Maggie Vespa, thanks so much.
And officials in Oregon just reported something kind of unsettling. Someone was just diagnosed with the plague. Yes, the same bubonic plague that wiped out tens of millions of people during the medieval times. Get that to the lab and call the CDC. Tell them what? We have a patient with the plague. The black plague? That was my exact reaction, too. But there is no need to break out the beak masks just yet because it might not be as serious as we think. While this is Oregon's first case in about 10 years, there are about seven cases of bubonic plague in the U.S. every single year. And thanks to modern medicine, it's treatable now. But what's so interesting about this case in particular is that it looks like it might have come from a pet cat. That's right, someone's beloved kitty. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Cats, uh, how does this happen? Yeah, Gotti, if, if you're doing a double take because you're wondering, is this still happening and why in cats? I'm with you. And it generally comes from infected fleas. So that's kind of where bubonic plague, this specific type of plague starts. And then in general, people can get it from infected animals, usually rodents, but it can happen in cats. And that's likely where the animal to human transmission came in. It's why we warn people to not get near any animals that are either dying or sick for exactly this reason. Yeah, but cuddling with your kitty, that's all like a whole different is, thing. Your I mean, pet is a whole different level. I agree. Here's <laughs> right. the good news. I, I should say this up top. Antibiotics are incredibly effective, and in this case, were administered to the human. So the, I, I would just like to say that this isn't as scary as it used to be in the middle of evil times when it did kill people, but this is something, obviously, that needs to be diagnosed and treated promptly. Uh, so, so what wiped out whole communities back mm -hmm. in the day... Right. It's all treated by an antibiotic now? Yeah, several antibiotics. So there's actually even also a vaccine. They use that vaccine kind of in limited situations because the vaccine isn't really used to kind of prevent you from getting sick. It's really once you have been infected, it can be used and there's guidance for that. But really very common available antibiotics once recognized can be treated. But Gotti, we just don't see a lot of the bubonic plague. And the word bubonic, it's caused by a bacteria, Yersinia pestis. And the bubonic part comes when the bacteria infects the lymph nodes. And when you have swollen lymph nodes, those are called bubos. And that's where the name comes from. So that can be one of the signs if you didn't have an infected animal and you don't know what you have we can test for it but we also look for those symptoms in this case infected lymph nodes some skin symptoms we can also see general symptoms that look like the flu so we have to kind of keep your guard up and if you've had a history of handling any animals and even a pet let us know so that we can make sure you, you get diagnosed <laughs> i mean uh for my fellow hypochondriacs out there that will see that list and be like, oh, fever, chills, yeah. uh, flu-like symptoms, it's, great, I have the plague. Um, I have the that, plague, right. Do you no, immediately you tell your doctor, I have a cat and I'm worried about the plague or do you just <laughs> monitor? No, I, I, I do think just to keep in mind that this is definitely from contact with an animal who is sick. I know that the case in Oregon that they did trace that this was in fact a sick animal. Now. Having mm -hmm. said that, it's just always good to have like a very broad history. So in this case, it was easy to kind of figure out where did the transmission occur, infected flea, cat to human. But when anything is vague, sometimes when you probe in the history, you're like, well, we did see, you know, a dead rodent in a household. And so mm -hmm. people would naturally try to remove it. So got it. bottom line, it's still incredibly rare. And it is something that we can both diagnose and treat and see under a microscope. So you don't have to worry about presenting and saying, do I have the plague? You just have to give us a pretty complete history. And I have to be honest, I didn't think I'd be here reporting on the bubonic plague, but right. it does make attention to what you brought up, that this happens every year. And while it's rare, it still happens. And we do have available treatments. <laughs> thank God for modern medicine. Dr. Yes. Patel, thank you so much for joining us. And still to come, Alexei Navalny, one of Vladimir Putin's most outspoken critics, died in prison. We're going to tell you what we're learning about all that tonight, so stay tuned. 
Hey there, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. Zimbabwe's vice president says the government will block a university scholarship for LGBTQ people. Now, the country's constitution bans same-sex marriages, and the scholarship is sponsored by an LGBTQ organization that's been offering awards since 2018. But recent ads led to today's response from the vice president. And Greece has legalized same-sex marriage for the first time. It is the first Orthodox Christian country to do so. The bill also allows same-sex couples to adopt children and gives full parental rights to married partners. And Mexico and FIFA are in court over a decade-long dispute over soccer fans' gay slurs. Now, FIFA has held that the Mexican Soccer Federation is responsible, and they've handed out fines and closed stadiums because of the behavior. The latest appeal by Mexico challenged penalties of $114,000 imposed by FIFA. There's no update yet on when that final ruling will happen. And thousands of Indian farmers have been on a protest march to New Delhi demanding higher prices for their crops. They paused their march today demanding unions hold another round of talks with the government on Sunday. This is all months before India's national election season. And farmers are a very influential voting group. And the loudest critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin's regime is mysteriously dead tonight. Alexei Navalny died at a remote penal colony. At least that's the word that's coming from Russian prison authorities. And a lot of his supporters are mourning his death, protesting his death, with some placing flowers in his honor. And Navalny's death seems to have shocked world leaders, although President Biden does not appear to be one of them. Take a listen. We don't know exactly what happened, but there is no doubt that the death of Navalny was a consequence of something that Putin and his, and his thugs did. Now, throughout his time as opposition leader, Navalny had been attacked. Then in 2020, German authorities confirmed that he was poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent, putting him into a coma. He survived that, and Navalny spoke openly about being assassinated in 2017 in an interview with CBS News. What do you think the probability is that you will end up in prison? Mr. Putin uh, personally decided such uh, things, and no one understands what's in his head. What do you think the chances are you'll end up dead? Well, like, like you know, 50%. After recovering from being poisoned and returning to Russia from Germany, Navalny was thrown in prison where he had been serving multiple sentences that probably would have kept him locked up until at least 2031. This is an image right here that you're looking at when he was last seen alive, and that was just yesterday when he appeared in a court hearing through a video link. NBC News chief international correspondent Richard Engel has more. 47-year-old Alexei Navalny was looking healthy, joking with a judge via video link from his Arctic prison just yesterday. Navalny's mother saw him Monday and said he was in good spirits. Yet somehow, Alexei Navalny, Russian President Vladimir Putin's fiercest and most energetic critic, dropped dead suddenly at a penal colony in Siberia. Prison officials say Navalny went for a walk but felt unwell and quickly lost consciousness. They said medics could not revive him. President Biden blamed President Putin. Make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Moscow supporters laid flowers to honor Navalny, despite a warning from the state prosecutor that protests would not be allowed. When a woman tried to unfurl a sign, she was taken away by authorities. <laughs> Navalny started out as an anti-corruption blogger, exposing on his YouTube show the lavish lifestyles enjoyed by Putin and his inner circle. <laughs> Navalny was a central figure in massive protests against Putin in 2012. He was jailed and harassed and attacked with a green dye that damaged his right eye. In 2020, while on a flight in Moscow, Navalny suddenly fell ill. He was poisoned by a nerve agent and flown to Germany to recover. He blamed Putin for the assassination attempt. The Kremlin denied responsibility. And then came the most consequential decision of his life. Navalny returned to Russia after recovering from his poisoning. He deliberately put his life on the line and his principles first until his death today, which is not confirmed by his family, but who don't seem to doubt it. Navalny's wife, Yulia, in Munich, called for President Putin to be punished. 
Мы вместе сплотились. We should come together and fight against this evil, she said. In 2021, President Biden warned Putin of devastating consequences if anything happened to Navalny in Russian custody. NBC's Peter Alexander pressed him on that today. What consequences should he and Russia face? That was three years ago. In the meantime, they faced a hell of a lot of consequences, and we're contemplating what else could be done. Richard Engel and Peter Alexander, thanks so much. And turning now to the Middle East, new satellite images are showing a wall being built along Egypt's border with Gaza, right near the city of Rafah, where more than a million people have taken refuge since the start of Israel's ground invasion. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter has more. Pictures and videos and even satellite images for the last couple of days uh, have seemed to show Egypt fortifying its border on the Rafa side of the Egyptian border, essentially building a wall. And then also in these photos, it shows Egyptian uh, workers appear to be clearing a huge space. Now, observers have suggested that they may be preparing for an Israeli ground incursion into Rafa. Rafa is that southernmost Gazan city we've been talking so much about, where 1.4 million displaced Palestinians have been pushed south really crammed up against that Egyptian border because the Israeli military told them it would be safe. And now, as Prime Minister Netanyahu threatens a ground incursion, um, Egypt has been worried that Israeli troops may come up to that border. Now, late tonight, there was a statement from the Egyptian state information that doubles down on Egypt's position. They say they do not support Israel's threatened incursion into Rafah, but they also don't want to be seen. And they say they're not doing this but they do not want to be seen as preparing for a forced displacement of Palestinian people. And they also say that Israeli tanks and Israeli troops near their border would threaten the 1979 peace treaty. I do just want to touch on one other thing. For the second time this week, President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu have spoken on the phone. And for the second time this week, President Biden has publicly warned the Israeli prime minister about a ground incursion that happens without a plan to safeguard the 1.4 million people. He actually spoke today again about it. Take a quick listen. Well, first of all, I've had extensive conversations with the prime minister of Israel over the last several days, almost an hour each. And uh, I've made the case, and I feel very strongly about it, that there has to be a uh, a temporary ceasefire to get the prisoners out, to get the hostages out. And that is underway. I'm still hopeful that that can be done. And in the meantime, uh, I don't anticipate, I'm hoping that, uh, you, that the uh, Israelis will not make any massive land invasion in the meantime. Um, so it's my expectation that's not going to happen. There has to be a ceasefire temporarily to get those hostages. By the way, there are, we're, we're in a situation where there are American hostages. American citizens are being held hostage. It's not just, not just Israelis, it's American hostages as well. And, uh, you know, uh, my hope and expectation is that we'll get this hostage deal. We'll bring the Americans home, and the deal is being negotiated now, and uh, we're going to see where it takes us. Now, U.N. agencies, international agencies on the ground have warned of the catastrophic consequences, not only that the 1.4 million people have nowhere to go, that it would completely knock out the vital humanitarian aid effort that's based in Rafah, but also that it would lead to a catastrophic and massive loss of civilian life. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Jerusalem. Molly, thanks so much. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And if you thought the crypto craze was over, well, Bitcoin looks like it's back in a big way with the price soaring once again. So we are taking you all the way to Kenya, where it is a hot topic at this tech summit that's going on right now. So stay tuned. And now in the future of everything, I guess you could call it the little crypto that could, because after losing more than 75% of its value, the price of Bitcoin has come racing back. Now, it hasn't reached the November 2021 peak of nearly $69,000 per Bitcoin, but it is the highest it's been in more than two years. And believe it or not, that is the hot topic at the Africa Tech Summit in Nairobi. Let's go there now with CNBC's technology reporter, Mackenzie Sigalos. Mackenzie? 
I'm here in Nairobi for the Africa Tech Summit, where CEOs, coders, and venture capitalists from across the continent are talking about everything from generative AI being used to transform banking in Africa to crypto and the massive run-up in the price of Bitcoin. The world's largest cryptocurrency is trading about $52,000, a price high that it hasn't seen since 2021. In total, there is more than $1 trillion worth of Bitcoin in circulation right now. Part of that rise has to do with all of these major Wall Street firms launching their own spot Bitcoin ETFs, which has made it easier than ever for both everyday customers and larger institutional players to buy Bitcoin. But Bitcoin's price also has a lot to do with how it's being adopted in emerging markets that have spiraling inflation and prohibitive capital controls that arguably need this kind of virtual currency the most. One reason why Bitcoin is so disruptive in Africa is the fact that there's virtually no access to dollars across the continent. So if you go to a bank and need to make an international payment, you can't really do that with traditional financial infrastructure because there is very little liquidity of local African currencies. Here in Kenya, I've been speaking with business leaders and technologists who say that there is a lot of value being found in moving money across borders with the help of Bitcoin and other dollar peg stable coins like USDC. These crypto based payment solutions bypass banks, which is a good thing because there's a lot of friction in the existing financial system. Bitcoin is also appealing because the network itself is decentralized, meaning that it cannot be shut down by other people, including governments. I spoke with Eric Hersman, a Nairobi based Bitcoin miner who runs one of the largest mining operations in Africa. Most people think about Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin and how they could save value in it and maybe spend it. That doesn't happen without the Bitcoin miners. And us being globally distributed to make that happen, it secures the network and allows it to be uh, a much safer investment of your time and money uh, rather than you know, some of these other cryptos that are out there that are centralized and therefore can be shut down by other people. A lot of fintech and crypto experts here in Kenya also tell me that this bull run in Bitcoin feels a lot healthier than the last time Bitcoin surpassed 50K. It's the first time that it's happened in a post FTX era. And the consensus around the space is that the price threshold is a lot more sustainable this time around. And Mackenzie Segalos reporting from Nairobi. Mackenzie, thank you so much for that. And it is Friday, and that means it is time to send you into your weekend with 60 seconds of joy. And first, the Denver Zoo has a new mouth to feed. In fact, a few new mouths to feed. They recently rescued nearly 130 animals, including this toucan, some wallabies, and even this blue-tongued skink. They all lived at the Sequest in Littleton, Colorado, but the aquarium closed after a bunch of citations and animal welfare concerns. And when the critters needed new homes, the Denver Zoo sprang into action, and now they are getting used to their new habitats at that zoo and all those visitors there. And in New Jersey, a community is helping make one little boy's dream come true. Now, Dashiell Previs, you can see him there. He's a sixth grader who has a kidney disease, but that's not slowing him down at all. He has some big plans to set a world World record and make the biggest, tallest structure out of magnet tiles. Those are those little magnetic construction toys. And today, his family, his friends, his teachers all helped him successfully build a 21 foot tall structure of those tiles. Take a look. It's not only building them, it is knocking them down. That is so much fun. It actually reached the ceiling of the school's auditorium, and Dashiell isn't stopping there. He wants to build one that is 50 feet, which would officially be the tallest one ever built. And that does it for us tonight. I will be playing with Magnetiles with you, Kira, my daughter, in just a little bit as soon as I get home. We'll be back on Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.